talented at Radiant and Jeffrey. And now, here's your man of the half hour, Skippy Lowe. Shepherd. North Carolina? Yes. Born there? A Tar Hill born. <laughs> really? And a Tar Hill bred. You still have that accent, don't you? Oh, yes. You hear it. But you didn't spend much time. You got out of there when you were a very young girl. Well, actually, I went through the fourth grade of school, uh -huh. and then I went back and forth between New York and North Carolina. My uh. mother was a teacher, uh -huh. and uh, she would come back at times and teach in North Carolina, uh -huh. so... Your mother had a lot to do with your career. Everything to do with it. Everything. You're saying everything. Yeah. I didn't have the drive. I didn't have the ambition. Uh, I had an inferiority complex that her mother didn't have for me. Uh -huh. So I really was just like a puppet for her. Uh -huh. I would never have done anything, accomplished anything, if she really? hadn't been behind me all the way. Yes. Uh -huh. Powers model. Powers model, yes. Really? At 15 to subsidize my musical studies in New York City. Mm -hmm. Opera? You were studying? Well, I was studying opera there, yes. And I was singing at the Man Manhattan Opera House. Uh -huh. Manhattan Opera Company, which was in Carnegie Hall. Right. And uh, who did you study with? His name is Marchese, Maestro Marchese. Uh huh. Hard work, though, isn't it? Learning all those languages. How many languages did you have to learn? Well, I sang mostly in Italian, some in French. I did the Italian mm -hmm, operas. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one I ever did was Pagliacci. I did Netta and Pagliacci. My favorite. And then I was working on um, Bohème. Uh -huh. and uh, Madame Butterfly, uh -huh. and uh, later on I did Tosca became my number one role because my voice dropped a little when I was very right. young, I was a coloratura. Uh -huh. And I found in Madame Butterfly singing six sustained high uh -huh. C's in a row was uh -huh. very taxing. Something happened uh, at, in Brooklyn. I think you were doing the opera in Brooklyn or something like that? Yeah, happened? well that was many years later. Really? Yes, I was. I, but I had been on the contract to Metro and uh, oh, this is before. RKO okay. and and Republic, uh -huh. and I was under contract to RKO. And as a matter of fact, I was studying with a man named Mebin Beasley, who was my voice coach for years and years in right. California. Mm -hmm. And uh, during, I was working on Tosca, and while we were singing, the door burst open, and in walked this gentleman in a white suit, and this long black hair, and a white fedora, uh -huh. and a black cane. And he walked in, and he says, you must uh, sing a Tosca for being a Brooklyn. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I thought, the man's crazy. Uh -huh. And I realized he had to be a some person. <laughs> he wouldn't be dressed like that in the first place. He wouldn't dare. Uh -huh. So uh, his name was Maestro Alfredo Salmaggi, who ran the Brooklyn Opera House. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, so when he left, my teacher said, well, why don't you do it? I had done it here. I did uh -huh. with the American Opera Company here in Los right, Angeles. Right. And he said, well, why don't you come back and do Brooklyn? Uh, Tosca for me in Brooklyn, and uh -huh. I said, well, let's talk about it. And we did. We got permission from RKO. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't even know I sang opera there. I just sang uh -huh. little diddly bump things. Uh -huh. And Peter in Rathbun was head of the studio. Uh -huh. And uh, he had said, you sing opera? And I said, oh, yes, I've been working on opera for years and years. So he said, we have my blessings. Go and do it. Spend two weeks in New York, uh -huh. do publicity for RKO, and do your opera. So I sang the first performance I did which is kind of a funny little story about it, if I may tell yeah, you. Yeah, please do. We rehearsed in the afternoon, and the tenor I was singing with, who later became a well, very, very well-known tenor, I won't mention uh -huh. his name, he was very short and rather slight. Uh -huh. And he did the whole afternoon rehearsal with a scarf, as a lot of opera singers do, wrapped around his face this way. And he just, mar he didn't sing a note, <laughs> but he had the scarf around his face. So after the rehearsal was over, and I came back, and I went to my dressing room ready for the performance, um, it is, Tosca makes her entrance, coming into an abbey, and the, uh, her tenor is waiting there for her, and she comes on, Mario, 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 and he says, Son of Queen, and she did this beautiful sweeping entrance uh -huh, into the opera. Uh -huh. So <laughs> came my, ta my musical cue, and I came, Mario, 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 and I heard this, Son of Queen, and I came beautifully on, you know, and uh -huh. I looked, and it, I said, who the Sam Hill It was an entirely different tenor. <laughs> he was fat and he was cross-eyed, and I had never seen him rehearse with him before. My other tenor apparently had been taken ill. Uh -huh. So that was quite an experience. But backstage, the <laughs> opera was Funny. such a success uh -huh. that they asked me, you know, big headlines in the New York uh, news in the mirror would say, right. Hollywood starlet does opera, and they had, right. you know, very pr provocative pictures of me on the cover. And uh, they asked me would I do an extra special matinee. They were uh -huh. going to put on a matinee because everything was booked. Mm -hmm. 
So my music teacher said, Mr. Beagle, so why not stay and do one more? And so when I did the matinee, after the matinee, this little man, very short little man with tufts of hair here and kind of rough teeth and, uh -huh. and eyeglasses, and a taller gentleman with gray hair and glasses, they came backstage and they said, uh, we have a question. I am Kurt Vile and this is Maurice Bravenel, and uh, we have a, have a musical show we would like for you to consider doing. And I said, oh, no, 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 I have to go right back to Hollywood. You know, I'm on a contract. And they said, we would like to talk to you about it. And of course, out of deference to Kurt Weil, how could I say no? He said, would you please come just and listen to my music? Right. So we made an appointment, and we went to Dwight Deere's office up above the Adelphi Theater, and uh -huh. it was a little old rickety piano. Uh -huh. And Kurt Weil sat down at this little piano in this sort of dingy office with all the din of New York coming through the windows. Love it. And he started playing this music and singing in his squeaky little voice. I have never been so enthralled by anything in my life. I said, oh, I have to do it. I have to do it. <laughs> and I got right on the phone. It was Kurt Weill's street scene. Street scene. The oh, Elmer Wright Pulitzer right. Prize play. Wonderful. I got right on the phone. I called Mr. Rathman. I said, Mr. Rathman, I have found a musical written by Kurt Weill, the Elmer Rice play. And I would just give anything to be able to do it. Will you hear me out? And uh, he said, well, fly back to California and we'll talk about it. So I did, and he gave me permission. I took a six-month uh, suspension from RKO. And the critics gave it such, oh, you got yes. such critical acclaim. Oh, uh, yes. Critical acclaim. Critical right. acclaim. Mm -hmm. Was one. Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Step Lively. Yes. Tell me about Frank Sinatra and Step Lively. This was at what studio? At RKO. The, uh, RKO? Um, they bought my contract from Republic Studios to do that film. Really? Yes. Tell me about Frank Sinatra at RKO. Well, in Who's those he? days, yeah, he was, I found out now, he was much older than I, I didn't realize it, but he, uh, he was a short, energetic, flashing blue eyes and a flashing smile, uh -huh. and uh, very, very appealing. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't quite understand what all the hoorah was about, with his screaming and tearing uh -huh. his clothes off and things. I was just assigned to do a picture with him. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't his first. Higher no. and Higher was his first, with Barbara Hale, I remember that. Mm. But Step Lively was later in his career? I don't yeah. think, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Who's in the film with you? Um, Adolph Manjou. It was a remake of Hotel. Right. Let's right. see, oh gosh. It was a good movie. Uh, Eugene Paulette, uh -huh. Gloria De Haven played the love interest. I played the vamp. Uh huh. Um, oh, so many, many stars were in it. I love, I love that movie. I thought it was a great movie. Did you really? Yeah, I loved it. I thought Do it was you remember fun. the scene in the phone booth, the number I did with him? I, yes, corner, yes, I yes, chase yes. him as the vamp, I chase him uh -huh. throughout the film, yeah. and I finally get him cornered in a telephone booth. Uh -huh. And we did this number uh, in the phone booth, was written by Sammy Kahn. Sammy so Kahn, we yeah. spent two weeks in a phone booth together. We couldn't do that today. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough Republic room. Studios, how long were you with them? About a year and a half. What did you do for, with them? Uh, you did a lot. Yes, I did. A I lot did. of work I played them. a lot of uh, dumb blondes. Uh, gangster malls, uh -huh. and I went to the head of the studio. I said, "Can't I play a nice, simple girl?" Uh -huh. And they said, "Well, the only parts like that are uh, in westerns." And I said, "Well, right. let me do a western." They said, "You're kidding. You want to do a western?" I said, uh -huh. "Yes, very much so." Right. But they signed me to a series with Gabby Hayes and Wild Bill Elliott. Bill Elliott, that's I right. I was stuck with eight of them. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it was a wonderful learning experience for me. This was as I went from Metro doing I Married an Angel with Jeanette and Donald sure. Nelson. Eddie. That's what I want to get back. Yeah. Yes, um, and went to Republic. Uh huh. Uh, I, it was really a learning experience for me. Jeanette McDonald, Nelson. Oh Eddie. yes. Oh, I loved Nelson. I still do. He was my hero. Was he? Yes, my grandmother took me to all see all his films, uh -huh. all the Jeanette McDonald Nelson right. Eddie films. And she was my idol, and he was my hero. I was so in love with him. As a matter of fact, when he was married, when he got married, mm -hmm. I was 13 years old, and I was in Hendersonville, North Carolina, visiting with my sister who uh -huh. lived there. And when I heard it on the air, I cried, climbed up an apple tree in the orchard, out in the apple orchard, uh -huh. and cried all afternoon because he didn't wait for me to grow up. Uh -huh. I told him that many years later. <laughs> Did you really? But he was wonderful, wonderful to work with. It, on the set with Jeanette McDonald, I mean, come on, it must have been the thrill for Ann Jeffries. Why, yes. I mean, and uh, Jeanette, you know, wore all these big wigs and things. It was a costume thing yes. called I uh -huh. Married an Angel, and she would retire to her dressing room immediately after uh -huh. the scenes. Whereas Nelson would stay around, and he was 
would sing the Mikado or right. some uh, Gilbert and Sullivan opera and tap dance and tell stories and jokes. He was so different from what he came off on the screen. He uh -huh. wasn't stoic at all. He was very warm, very was charming, he? wonderful sense of humor. Uh -huh. And one of the biggest thrills I got on the picture was towards it, we shoot, we uh, filmed for uh, three months. Right. And towards the end of the shoot, he um, came to me. I was sitting in a makeup chair in a very elaborate costume, right. getting my makeup checked. And he came to me and he stood behind the chair and said, Cameron, would you come over here and take a picture with me with a quiet one, which uh -huh. was the last time anyone ever calls me a quiet one. Uh -huh. And uh, he had at the end of the picture, he presented that photograph, autographed thing to Ann Jeffries from her adoring slave, Nelson Eddy. Adoring slave. Oh, <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I just, that just melted me completely. Topper. I mean, that, you know, that is the most adorable, adorable yes, show. I love a good series. series. One of the best yes. ever on television. Yes. Thank Ann you. Jeffries. Thank you. I mean, Topper. The world loves Topper. Tell me about, how did you get that role? Well, Robert and I, you know, I married to Robert, Robert Sterling. Robert Sterling, that, yeah. that's right. We're going to get to that. And uh, we were playing, we had a nightclub act, and we were playing The Sands in Las Vegas. And I got a call from my agent, and he said, uh, I've got an offer here for you and Robert to do uh, George and Marion Kirby on a new television series called Topper, mm. a make of the Topper films. Right. And I had also been a big fan of the Topper films. Right. And I said, oh, yes, 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 will do. Uh -huh. So they sent us a script. We loved it. And we finished our engagement there, and we came here to Los Angeles to play at the Coconut Grove. Grove. And while we were playing the Grove, uh, we filmed the pilot uh -huh. during the day. Right. We went to San Francisco to the Fairmont Hotel where we were playing, and right. they called us and said, cancel your tour, it's sold immediately. <laughs> Some sort of a record uh -huh. for the selling of a... So you were doing your club appearances? Yes. All through, um, and you and Robert Sterling. Yes. And this, this happened. Yes. while you were doing all yes. your club appearances. Weren't we lucky? You were working many clubs at that time. Yes. How did you meet your husband, Robert Sterling? Come <laughs> on. This is well, actually, I met him on Broadway. You did? I had never met him in California at all. Uh -huh. He was a friend of the publicity man from RKO, uh, John Springer. Do you know John? Of course I know John. Very well. Well, John Charming. introduced us, and uh, we met. And I was very involved with another gentleman at the time that we met. So it never occurred to me, and first of all, a good-looking actor, you know, wow, get <laughs> away from that. But my mother fell in love with him. She said, now, this is the man you should marry. Your mother? My mother. Here she comes back oh, into your life oh, always, again. Always, always. Helping you again. Always. Ah. And um, so a year later, we re-met again on Broadway. Mm -hmm. He came in with Gramercy Ghost, and he was playing the Roscoe Theater, and I was with Kiss Me Kate at the Schubert Theater. Right, right. And uh, we started seeing each other, and we were called the Romance of Schubert Alley. Uh -huh. And he wore me down six months. We uh -huh. were married. I had to break off with my other bow, which broke my heart. I really loved my... You can love two men at the same you time. You can? Yes. Was he an actor? No. He wasn't? No. But Robert Sterling got Anne well, Jeffrey's heart. Though. he said, don't make any plans. He was taking over, and he did. <laughs> Cole Porter, tell me. Love Cole Porter. Oh, yes. One of my favorites. What a lovely gentleman. Tell me about Cole Porter, because you did one of, my best uh, one of my favorite shows, Kiss Me Kate. It's a great show. Cole came to me. I was um, at the Greek Theater doing either Bittersweet or Merry Widow. Merry Widow. Merry Widow. Because I did several You did there. three of them there. Yes. Yes, yes. And he came backstage, and he said, Anne, I have written a musical version of The Taming of the Shrew with you in mind. I hope you'll be able to do it. Uh -huh. And I said, when are you going into production? He said, in about two months. And I was already tied up and committed to Mr. J.J. Schubert to do my romance. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, gosh, I, it sounds marvelous. And I love Taming the Shrew. And the musical version, wonderful. Uh -huh. But I said, I'm committed. To, you know, I'm really contractually bound by this thing. And he said, I'll yes. buy the contract out. And I said, no, Mr. Schubert is very old. And this will probably be the last production he will ever be involved with. Uh -huh. And he's been good to me, and I said, I, I'm really obligated morally to do this play. Mm -hmm. And I love the play, too. Right. And uh, so that was where he said, oh, gosh, he said, well, if, do you have anybody in mind? I said, test my understudy of a girl named Frances McCann, a redhead, right. fiery girl. Mm -hmm. I said, test her. She would probably be wonderful. He said, I've also been thinking about my dear, lovely uh, Pat Morrison. And I said, oh, oh give it yeah. to Pat. She needs the uh -huh. break, and she's wonderful, and she's lovely. So he took Pat, and uh -huh. the rest is history. My show closed in six months, uh -huh. 
And he came to me again and mm -hmm. asked me would I like to do the national company. You went to Washington? And no, uh, I didn't, didn't say Washington? Washington. No, we came, we opened here in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. For the L.A. Civic uh -huh. Light Opera. Then we played San Francisco, and then I spent a year in Chicago. Uh -huh. And then he came to me again and said, would I like to uh, either go to London with the show mm -hmm. or take over the New York show? Well, Pat wanted to go to London, mm -hmm. and I wanted to stay closer to my California right. boyfriend. Right. Right. You know, he could fly to New York, but flying to London uh -huh. uh, for weekends was a little rough. So the rest is history. I stayed in two years of my life was spent in that show. Cole Porter, is there anything back in your mind about him that really you can share with me right now? Something very well, special. He was, he, yes. he was a special human being. Yes, he was. He was a very warm, uh, understanding person. Uh, I had a little problem when I first went into the New York show with the conductor. The conductor did wa not want to do my tempos. Uh -huh. He wanted to do his tempos. And I'd already <laughs> been doing the show for a year. Yeah. And I've, I have a metronome in my head. Yes, you know, once it's correct. set, that's it. And he would want to go faster here and slower there. And he really said, you do it my way or else. And I said, wait a minute. And I went to the phone. I called Cole. I said, Cole, I'm having a little bit of a problem with the conductor uh -huh. on tempos. And he said, my dear, your tempos are wonderful. You tell him, I will speak to him. Whatever tempos you're doing them at are perfect. Uh -huh. And he just ironed the whole. He didn't get excited. He didn't get upset. He never he, get excited. No, he? I never saw him. I just saw him as a sweet, warm, wonderful man. Uh-huh. Isn't that interesting? I adored him. So did Pat. He was very, very Anybody well... Anybody that worked for him loved him. You know, he had that, that command of, mm -hmm. of, of warmth, loving, and authority at the same time. Uh -huh. And Jeffrey seems very happy today. Oh, I am, you yes. Have, how many children does Andrew I have three grown sons, and I have three grandchildren. I have uh -huh. a wonderful husband. Uh-huh. Robert Sterling. We've been married. It'll be tw 39 years 39. in November. 39? Yes. Oh, God, Jan. Congratulations. Yeah, I thought it wouldn't work. Mother knew. Mother knew. What's Ann Jeffrey's secret? You look so beautiful. Oh, aren't you? You dear. are just the, the lady of this town. Thank Absolutely you. elegant and just beautiful. What is your secret, Miss Jeffries? What do you? What time does Ann Jeffries get up of the day? Or <laughs> I know if you're I have a my busy, choice. busy. Yeah. Well, when I'm not working, I get up around 11 o'clock. My time. And uh, also, I'm a nocturnal person. I sleep, and I go to sleep about average of four, three or four in the morning, never before three. Really? Even if I have to get up before <laughs> the work. I just finished a film called Clifford, uh -huh. uh, which was great fun. I had to get up at four in the morning, so, you know, one hour of sleep the first night was all I got. Uh. But I seemed to be able to run on very little sleep. Really? Yes. Clifford, tell me about this movie you just did. Oh, uh, I had such a good time. Who's in it? Um, Charles Grodin and Martin Short. Oh, I and love Mary Martin Short. And Mary uh -huh. um, It's I haven't done a film, real, a movie movie since 1968. Really? And I had forgotten how much time they take and how many takes they take. Of course, in General Hospital, right, you, you right. shoot it before you learn it, right, practically. Right, right, right. And it was such a luxury for me. And they were such wonderful people. Charles Grodin is a very lovely gentleman. Uh -huh. And he's playing the very subdued role. And of course, Martin Short is wild. Adorable. Isn't he adorable? He, yeah. He's one of the funniest people yeah. I've ever been around yeah. in my life. Yeah. And Mary Steenburgen is so sweet and so uh -huh. dear. And the director was wonderful, Paul uh -huh. Flaherty. And the cameraman, uh -huh. uh, John, um, I don't know, Al, uh, uh, Oh, God. Mary is an excellent actress. Yes, she is. She really is underrated right now. Yeah, oh, I, I don't think, think so. She's no? won. She's she's she won, won an award. Academy and an oh, Emmy. She's and a wonderful actress. Wonderful actress. And Martin Short, I adore him. Oh, he I is think he's so great. dear. Yeah. I just he's playing a ten-year-old boy in this. Yeah, he is. A demon monster of a child. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's just as wild and wonderful. What is your husband doing now, Mr. Sterling? What is Robert Sterling doing? At, at this, this moment, moment, he's in Las Vegas playing golf. Is he? Yes. Uh, he's uh, he, still he's an avid golf player. Uh -huh. He's beginning to do some commercials now, which yes. I'm very pleased with. He's retired completely from the business for about 15 years uh -huh. and was manufacturing custom-made golf clubs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became a little more than we could handle. So, he General was, Hospital. Yes. And Jeffries. And Jeffries don't need General Hospital, but General Hospital wanted Ann Jeffries. Tell me about that. Well, Marvin Page called me. Robert was in the hospital having a back operation, and uh, Mar uh, Marvin couldn't reach me. He traced me down to the hospital room where I was sitting with Did Robert he really? and presented General Hospital to uh -huh. me, and I said, oh, no, no, I don't really want to do a soap, soap opera. Uh -huh. 
Uh, I had done one a few years before, and it uh -huh. had not been a pleasant experience for me, a thing called Bright Promise, with many of the people that are, were then in General Hospital when yes, I went yes. in with it. And he said, um, look, uh, he said, just all you have to do is like 10 performances at the most, just a small part on it, uh -huh. uh, I mean, in time. And he said, uh, I said, no, 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 I don't think so. And he said, look, it was good enough for Elizabeth Taylor, it was good enough for Milton Berle and Sammy Davis. Right. They all did these small parts, uh, right. cameo parts, or whatever you want to call them. And he said, but isn't good enough for you? And I said, oh, Marvin, if you'll just get off my back, I'll do, do it. it. Let me get Marvin out of the hospital. And, and so I went on for 10 shows, and here it is six years later. And, and you're still on them. <laughs> I'm still going in and out of General Hospital. Is, and that, I, is Aunt Jeffries enjoying it? Yes. You do? Yes. I love working. You do love working? I love work. I think that's one thing that keeps me young. Keeps me. I never stop. I work, work, work. And I don't, I don't say no very, very seldom do I say no to a role. Uh -huh. If it's something challenging and not what I think is the real me or what I would like to do, mm -hmm. I'll take it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. You and John F. Kennedy have something very much in common. Camelot. Oh, yes. It's your favorite. Yes. And his is his favorite. I had the honor of doing it at the National Theater in right. Washington shortly after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And um, one afternoon, the matinee, I came running into the theater, and some man stopped me and did a check thing on me before I came. I thought, why have they got the FBI uh -huh. here? Uh -huh. And uh, they said, well, there's some very special people in the audience today. And so everybody had to be checked, you, you know, with it, everything, the yes. detectives. And, uh, of course, it leaked out that the Kennedys were coming to the show. So the whole yes. family and the FBI took up the first three rows in the uh -huh. center. And Ethel and Bobby and the children and all were there. Mm -hmm. And to look out, I cry when I think about it, to look out and see them with the tears streaming down their oh. face. Because it was his was favorite his show. Favorite. Yes, it was very difficult on the cast. And it's your favorite, too. Isn't oh, it? I love it. I love it. You enjoy the, doing the show. That and The King and I. I see tears in your eyes. Yes, Jeffrey. well, it was a very emotional evening for Seems us. like you're very spiritual. Thank you. You are spiritual. Yes, yes. I have ESB and all those things, you've all had inherited some, from my mother. So you've had some good times in your life. Looking back, would you, would you do it the same way? Yes. Yes. By all means, I would have the same mother to guide me through it, too. Your mother? Yes. Very, very special, special lady. If I could write, and I've been... People have talked to me about writing a book of my various experiences and write a book about mother. She was a very, very unusual woman. What would Anne Jeffries call the book if, because you mentioned your mother, she's so much responsible for Anne Jeffries' career and yes. life. And yes. What would you call the book? Would you have a title? Or? I would like to call it Kiss Me Kate. Her name Kiss is Kate. Ah. Uh, but of course, and I that's one of your other favorite shows. Yes, I loved Kate. Yes. Two years of my life, and mother right there guiding me. And, but she wasn't a backstage mother. She wasn't? No, you never saw her backstage. She never interfered. She guided me. Uh -huh. um, she would come back and sit in the house and listen to the show. And some nights I'd say, she escorted me home every evening when we were in New York. She did. And she oh. would say, uh, I'd say, gee, I felt so good tonight. I really gave a terrific show. I gave my all tonight. Uh -huh. She'd say to me, well, yes, you did give a good show, but it was not as good as last night's. And I'd say, why? I felt so good, you know? Uh -huh. And she said, you were more con in control last night. She when did you know. were cautious. Oh, yes. Isn't that amazing? Yes. She felt like she, she had a PhD. Mother was an egghead, really. Uh -huh. And she could sing and she could act and she was beautiful. But we D came from an old Southern family that uh -huh. didn't approve of a young lady going on the stage. Uh -huh. That's why when she found out I could sing at like a year and a half, uh -huh. she said, That's my singer. And she trained me and guided me from uh -huh. then on. Topper, I want to go back to Topper because it's. Ann Jeffries, Topper is one of the best series ever been on television. They, everybody loves Topper. And so many people say, and why Robert don't they Sterling. see it anymore? Yes, why? Why don't Well, they were done on film. We did 79 of them, and a King World Syndicates own them now. Right. Michael King is a very wonderful man, and he said that they show them in syndication around the country a little bit, but he said that they need a lot of work on them, and for uh -huh. some reason or other, they haven't, uh, haven't done it. They are shown, but... Uh -huh. I've never seen them in L.A. except one Fourth of July. Uh -huh. They had a, a, a marathon of, of uh, the top of films. I see. 
Any of your children in the business? No. No, Robert didn't want them to be. I had three sons. Really? And he says it's no profession for a man. Was so Robert regret, uh, does he have any regrets about the business, uh, Robert Sterling? Well, you know, Robert's a very strange, shy, inward type of person. He's a Scorpio, uh -huh. and I'm an Aquarian. Okay. As my dear friend Carol Wright used to say, we were the I only two possible. I was uh, an Aquarian, was uh -huh. the only one that could get along with a Scorpio, really. Uh -huh. But uh, yes, I loved him too. I Carol Wright, very much. Charming. I miss him very much. He used much. to call me, I was a Gemini, and he says, I don't know which one I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> He's so wonderful. I love yeah. him so. But uh, we worked very happily on the top of series together. So you we were very happy to yes, work, join we it worked, together. We worked together so well. Uh huh. You know, um, it was really a marriage made in heaven working together. And then when Robert decided he didn't want to work that much anymore, and then he had an agent that said, um, you shouldn't work together as a team all the time. Uh -huh. He said it to Robert, not to yes, me. He yes. was Robert's agent, not mine. Yes. And he wanted to split us up and get mm -hmm. Robert working alone. And Robert did a series called Ichabod and Me, and he was very unhappy with it. Uh -huh. And he said, I'm getting out of the business. I've had it. I don't want to do That's this it. anymore. Uh -huh. And I always thought it was strange because it was his choice to become an actor. Uh -huh. I liked acting, but I didn't like singing really as much. Uh -huh. um, so I'm an, I, I always consider myself a singing actor. Actor. But Ann Jeffries gave up singing for a while, and then you returned back to singing for... Yes. Tell me about that, Ann. Well, about four years, I decided that the voice was tired and that uh, I didn't want to sing anymore. Why? Well, as I said, I really wanted to be an actress. And the singing always seemed to be getting in the way. Such a great voice. Oh, thank you. But I had done about 38 different musical shows. Mm -hmm and uh, sung an awful lot, and I just decided to rest the voice for a few years. And just about a year and a half ago, I started it up again. I cranked it up and started vocalizing. And where did you start your performing? Did you perform somewhere? Actually, yes, at the uh, University of Alabama. A friend of mine down there called me and said they, were, they needed a singer for uh -huh. a uh, show they were doing, right. performance. And uh, would I do it? And I said, oh, no, I don't sing anymore, and I haven't been, I haven't done a nightclub act anymore. And he said, oh, I need you so badly. And I tried to get Carol Lawrence to do it. Uh -huh. But her manager said, no, she was booked. And out of desperation for this friend of mine, I said, yes, mm -hmm. I have six weeks. Huh. So uh -huh. for six weeks, I vocalized every day. I got music organized. Uh -huh. I got my orchestration done. And uh, I went and did it and had a wonderful uh -huh. time. And the audience was marvelous. Uh -huh. And it was just sort of a musical review of musical shows, mostly yes. that I had been in, except yes. I did sing the songs from Phantom of the Opera, which I wasn't in, and Cats, which I wasn't right. in. But uh, it was very successful, uh -huh. so I decided to keep it going. And Jeffries, every time I go out uh, to the Hilton or any of the other parts, there I Robert am. Sterling is not there inside. <laughs> here with Butch, who is Caesar Romero. Caesar Romero, Romero my Tell dear, dear me, friend. Why is your husband home and you're out with Caesar? Because he's very shy. He hates large crowds of people.